And hello and welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. They are still flooding in. Okay, I think everybody is in now. So we'll hand over the spotlight to William. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I am very pleased to be having this session this afternoon. We just finished a session on uh, protection of civilians and we were trying to explore innovative ways of uh, um, advancing protection of civilians in a context where access is limited, the crises are multiplying in terms of complexity and numbers. And I feel this session uh, brings an answer to, or one important answer to the previous session. This session is going to be exciting because it is asking us to really focus ourselves from the outset on the agency and leadership of communities in advancing protection solutions. And refreshingly, we aren't going to get there just at the end. It's not a, an afterthought that will be tacked on at the end. Rather, the entire premise today, this afternoon, is to look at the actions and influence of communities in engaging in negotiation both with state and non-state armed actors to understand the factors of success and the risks associated. Now, these negotiations must be understood as a critical form of self-protection. Any of us who have been in the field negotiating would know that. Communities are undertaking these kind of negotiating negotiation the whole time to uh, secure agreements for, uh, for kids, for students to go to school or to go to a clinic or a, to a pharmacy or access services uh, uh, of, of water or going to a market. There is negotiation with armed groups on, uh, on child knee mobilization when children are recruited uh, to take temporary breaks or to be demobilized totally. Now these efforts, their amount and their size and their impact is massive, is much bigger than our whole sector efforts combined. And it brings us to the humility and the reality that the communities are indeed the first and last responders when it comes to their protection. So for me today, this conversation offers an opportunity for us to collectively explore how we can further accelerate towards a more systematic approach to strengthening civilian self-protection. So there is a lot of instances where we have to be there. It's important to be there, this protection by presence. But this is also a space where we have to get out of the way and support the communities to do what they do best while we're keeping an eye on the do no harm principle that we are associated with. There has been some excellent efforts in this area over the last several years. We'll hear many about them today. There's a lot of leadership and drive from, from NRC, SAVE, uh, and many others who are in the session with us today. So I think today we are in a position to start focusing on understanding the successes and the failures and the limitations of these approaches. So we can use the next year to scale up and use more of the successes and explore more in the, in the failures to understand and adapt. And I hope by the end of the session today, we will get to a space where we can use today's conversation as a uh, starting point for the whole global protection cluster to, to use these individual successes and scale them up, but also to use next year's Global Protection Forum to report back on how much we have progressed in this area. So with this, 
I wish us all a very good session, very concrete dialogue, and I'm looking forward to learn and to make conclusions and take uh, steps forward after the session. Thank you, and over back to the production team. Okay, so uh, well, thank you very much, William, for that introduction. Uh, maybe we can just skip a couple of these slides. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the agenda of what do we wanted to talk through today? Uh, ah, yeah, the housekeeper rules as well. Uh, the agenda of what we wanted to talk through today. Uh, so as William said, we're looking at uh, community-led negotiations uh, around access and protection. Um, and certainly uh, William's introduction there, we talked about having, we're trying to use this avenue for uh, looking at answers to some of the questions that have been posed in other events throughout the Global Protection Forum, uh, both today and on other days as well. So just briefly, um, we have a great selection of speakers for you today. Um, I'm very excited to be part of the event. Um, we have, so I'm, myself, I'm with Save the Children. We have colleagues from NRC. We have colleagues from academia uh, and people who are at the forefront delivering some of these strategies already. Uh, I won't go through and introduce every individual person because we also want to give them a chance to speak. Um, but certainly we'll be looking at civilian agency in armed conflict, civilian self-protection as a modality in specialised protection work, uh, challenges and opportunities in this kind of work. And then hopefully we'll have a chance for um, closing remarks and a quick little bit of a Q&A uh, as well with the audience. Uh, so please, next slide. Then. So before we start, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, yes, of course, unless you're a speaker, uh, please keep microphones muted and video off. If you have questions or comments, please raise your hand and put a comment in the chat box. Uh, please type in the chat what country you're working for and what organization you're with. And please, for the speakers, I think I've already broken this rule, so I'll be conscious of that. Uh, we need to keep speaking slowly to allow interpreters to translate. I'll slow down. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, so, yes, this, as I said, the panel, uh, I, we can leave this up for a second while I start to introduce the project, but you can have a look at, uh, yeah, these are the speakers we will have today. But what is the, the project that we uh, save the children in NRC? We've been working for the past, around the past eight months now, and certainly looking ahead into next year. At how do we as organizations uh, understand and engage with negotiations that are very much ongoing by communities? Uh, so it is very much an area of innovation and emerging practice, but also, as you will see today, an area where many uh, academics, organisations and certainly communities have been doing a lot uh, for actually quite a long time. Uh, so in a way, we are we're playing catch up with an area that is, is very much emerging as an area of best practice. And in looking at uh, access and protection, it's not that we're looking at these to the exclusion of other factors. In fact, we're, we're focusing very much on the, the process of negotiation that communities are going through to establish yeah, better protection outcomes, to establish access to services. And then I think as William alluded to there, looking at you know, are there ways that we should stay out of the way uh, to not interfere with those delicate balances that communities may have established? Or are there perhaps ways that we can uh, contribute uh, and maybe support communities. I mean, these kinds of negotiations can be significant areas of risk, uh, but also can be the, the crucial element that provides communities with sustained access or protection. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah. So as I say, yeah, the project is, is focused on these areas. Uh, I think I may have covered all of this while I let you look at the panelists. Um, but as I say, uh, we're about to go into this, this research phase of the project. Uh, next month, we'll be going to, in fact, in just a couple of weeks now, we'll be going to South Sudan and Colombia to undertake research uh, in different project locations around the country uh, to understand how, how are communities in those areas engaging, negotiating with armed actors um, around protection and access. Our hope is that we will come back uh, from that with a series of good practices, maybe looking at what could be transferable to the humanitarian community, uh, but also to an extent this extends into conflict sensitivity uh, and really trying to understand what not to do as well. Um, so please, next slide. 
Yeah, so I've highlighted here just a couple of the key questions that we're looking to explore through this research. So certainly what roles do communities take in negotiations? Can and should we be involved in that space? Maybe the answer is often no. Uh, can we do this in a principled way? Uh, do, does actually a humanitarian approach or humanitarian principles actually limit the tools available to communities um, and maybe we would limit that by being involved. Maybe we need to stay away and allow communities to come with their own solutions. Then the, the reflections on the project deliverables. So obviously we will come out with a report uh, as is pretty standard, um, but also we want, to, we want to look into both programming approaches and how we monitor those kinds of approaches going forward. Uh, and then yes, as I said before, looking at how we can implement this as a, kind of guidance for our project staff on should they be involved, how can they be involved, and trying to understand the context that they are, they are working in and where these negotiations are ongoing. So that's just a very brief introduction. As I say, we have a lot of very good speakers to go through today. Uh, hopefully at the end, we will have time then to address some of the questions that you bring up in the chat. So please throw all of your questions in and we'll try and cover as many of those as possible. But without further ado, I think I'll hand over to, uh, to Oliver Kaplan. So over to you, Oliver. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone. It's good to see some familiar names in the chat as well. So today I'm going to talk about my research on supporting communities to resist war. And next slide, please. And so the, this research is based on my 2017 book, Resisting War, How Communities Protect Themselves. And this book really addresses the puzzle of how civilians who are unarmed can be effective against uh, armed groups or armed actors who are heavily armed in terms of providing their own protection. Next slide, please. And this book just recently came out this year in Spanish. So for those of you who are Spanish speakers, there's the Spanish edition, Resistir la Guerra. And as part of my research, going back to the mid 2000s, I started tracking cases of civilians organizing to protect themselves, essentially to fight for their own autonomy in the midst of conflict around the world. And you can just see here on the map, some of the countries that I've coded up. And uh, since this time, there have been a number of new uh, cases as well. So this is actually at this point slightly out of date, but you can see that this is a phenomenon that occurs around the world. And if you, next slide, you can see that actually we can also measure civilian organizations uh, at the very micro level as well. And this is an example of the Junta village councils that I've identified in Colombia. And I'll talk a little bit about more in a moment. And just one other example on the next slide is of the what are called the peace zones in the Philippines. And here you can see them at the level of barangays or the village councils in the Philippines. And a key part of my argument is that it's really community organization that allows civilians to take actions to protect themselves. And so this is just a, a photo from a community work within Colombia known as the ATCC, the Peasant Workers Association of the Karare River, a photo from 2013. And on the next slide, we'll see that what I argue is that community organization really enables nonviolent strategies that civilians can take, and that those strategies will then impact the outcome of violence. And in short, I look at two different types of organizations that help civilians cooperate. First, there are formal peace organizations known as peace zones, peace communities, they're designed specifically for peace and protection. But yet there are also other informal organizations such as village councils, cooperatives, religious institutions, among others, that also can help civilians organize themselves. And this slide didn't quite come out, but there are different nonviolent autonomy strategies, uh, including dialogue where the civilians are directly interacting with armed groups. So essentially just the cover of, of the book. And on the next slide here, I'll list some of these strategies that I've identified. These include things like uh, internal facing strategies that communities will use uh, mainly for their communities, such as dispute resolution, solving local disputes so armed actors don't solve them, propagating norms of non-participation in the conflict, and then others that are more overt or engaging with uh, armed groups, such as managing information and managing 
uh, people in the community who might collaborate with armed groups, as well as protesting against armed groups and leveraging their reputations. And then finally, there are um, different early warning systems to try to avoid violence, including part of that would be temporary displacement. And one of the strategies I talk about in more depth in a journal article uh, is uh, a type of dialogue that I, that I call rhetorical traps or basically civilians leveraging the prior statements of different armed actors uh, about adhering to uh, norms of protecting civilians. And uh, in this case, using that rhetoric to try to pressure armed groups to desist from using violence. And as a total uh, estimate of an effect in Colombia, I did an analysis of what are called the Junta Village Councils from around the country. And I looked at how the presence of these organizations correlates with a, what are called political homicides or essentially selective violence in the midst of armed conflict. And what I saw is that when you go from on average having lo a low level of these Junta Councils to a high level of these Junta Councils, you see an on average 25% reduction in this type of violence. And so this is just an average effect some well-organized communities may suffer more violence than, than the low-organized communities, but overall, it's possible to estimate uh, the effect of these community organizations on their own protection, as I argue, using nonviolent strategies. And I wanted to switch to a related project. So uh, most recently, uh, I published a paper based on field research with the uh, Red Cross in Colombia, looking at how international humanitarian organizations can support communities that are trying to protect themselves. So go ahead. Yeah, in 2017. So I identified theoretically what are some of the different support actors, including from domestic NGOs all the way to IGOs or even governments, as well as the types of support that they might provide. So there are certainly different types of support that can be used to protect. So accompaniment, solidarity, providing resources, advice and information sharing, backing in negotiations and even going public and message amplification. And I see some questions here. I'll share the links in a moment. Here's one of the links. And so one of the uh, frameworks I developed is looking at how communities and supporter organizations interact for protection. And you can see here, I just have a very simple uh, layout here of communities, whether they're unorganized or organized, and whether they have uh, no support or have some support. And what you see in the next slide is I really argue that it's this interaction of communities that are organized, receiving support, uh, getting high protection. I apologize, the Mac icons are not coming out here. So essentially that interaction of organized communities receiving support is theoretically going to generate the most protection. And here in the chat is the link to the ICRC related study. And so I see that communities uh, can receive different types of support from international organizations such as the ICRC. The ICRC in the, in the case that I studied in Colombia was providing things like risk, risk education awareness, assistance to reduce, reduce risk exposure and a small amount of helping to um, support social cohesion. They weren't quite yet at that time doing full uh, self-protection measures or other deeper engagement strategies with armed groups. And so in 2017, I accompanied an ICRC delegation team to the community of El Bagre in Northern Colombia. You can see we're just going in the land cruiser out to the village. And we went to see what kinds of uh, workshops the Red Cross were going to provide to try to support the community to start uh, helping it come together for its own self-protection. Uh, go ahead. And so, uh, so out here, we, we encountered a number of risks and I put up the uh, poster that I saw on the airport for the uh, neo-paramilitary commander Otoniel, who was actually just captured in Colombia on Saturday. Um, but this group of the, the um, Gaitanista Self-Defense Forces of Colombia was one of the armed groups in the area, as well as the ELN insurgent group, uh, contesting control of the area. So there were certainly some security risks that the community was coping with and the, the ICRC had to manage as well. And so here's the, just a quick picture of the team. We had different people providing um, health education as well as safe behaviors training, where to locate if uh, an attack should happen in the community, things like that. So just very basic things, but even those basic activities help bring the community together and help bring community members together who didn't normally interact. 
And so just a few quotes to leave us with, you know, the villagers uh, there were very supportive of the ICRC's presence. They said, because the ICRC educates armed actors in IHL, it's only one in 1,000 times that something happens with international actors present, and I feel at ease and protective. So this is a very reassuring quote. In addition, uh, there were some statements by other community leaders saying that the ICRC presence provides the confidence and backing for the community to hold their own dialogues with more recalcitrant or what they called macho or tough armed actors. And so you really see this interaction between the community level organization and then the support provided by the international actor. So just some conclusions, there are some opportunities and restraint for protecting war, and this can be measured empirically. As I argue, community organizations use sophisticated collective nonviolent strategies to resist war and protect themselves. And then community ICRC interactions or community and humanitarian interactions can help multiply the self-protection potential of these organizations and help expand the scope conditions under which they might be successful. It also notes some different challenges for the ICRC as well as other support actors. Neutrality can sometimes uh, cause a challenge for how deep um, some of these organizations might be willing to go in terms of engaging with communities. And there also might be some limits to how much self-protection uh, or social cohesion can be, can be provided. And so I'll just leave you with a thought that, you know, I think a key role of international organizations is to help share information uh, with other communities. Um, and part of that starts with looking around, seeing what happens, really listening to communities and then sharing in addition to look for how civilians can themselves be sources of peace. So with that, thank you very much. I put some links in the chat to the study and I look forward to the conversation and questions. Thanks very much, Oliver. And uh, yeah, thank you for all those contributions. I think you, you've already highlighted a, a few of the, the key areas that we're, we're focusing on there. I mean, I just want to pull out a few in case it, it provokes questions from our audience, but certainly some of those challenges around neutrality uh, and also, yeah, the, the level of social cohesion being a key factor as well. Uh, so you're pleased to members of the audience, if, if you have questions related to Oliver's presentation, please yeah, be sticking them in the chat uh, and we'll be gathering those for, for the end of the presentations. Uh, but now we're heading over to, uh, to Carla, Carla Suarez. Uh, so Carla is going to be talking more about the self-protection strategies and also her research, uh, in, particularly in DRC. Uh, so maybe Carla, over to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to uh, echo Ollie and thanking NRC and SAFE for organizing this panel and for inviting me to present uh, my research here uh, today. I'm delighted to be here. And so today I'm going to be speaking about a study that examines how civilians understand and practice their own protection measures in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC. And I, I become interested in this topic about 10 years ago when I first began uh, working with conflict affected communities in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. And while the context I worked in varied, one of the things that consistently stood out for me was the sophisticated knowledge that civilians had about armed actors and the patterns of violence. And I found that civilians develop strategies that, that not only respond to what's happening in front of them, uh, but draw on their past experiences to inform their future decisions. So in my writing, I refer to this as a form of lived knowledge. And this really is the basic premise of my work. Uh, next slide, please. So in my, in my research, uh, this is the basic question that I'm, I'm seeking to ask. And to answer this question, <clears throat> I conducted a multi-sided ethnographic research in two rural communities in the Eastern DRC between 2014 and 2015. I found that relations with armed actors and hierarchies of violence inform the self-protection strategies used by civilians. Um, but before looking at these findings in more detail, I want to give you a brief overview of the context and methods that I use, because I think that helps to kind of contextualize where these findings are coming from. Uh, next slide, please. So spanning over 20 years, armed conflict in the Eastern DRC has morphed into what's often described as a stable instability. Uh, currently, there are more armed groups operating in the region than there were during the Congo Wars. The map uh, shown here created by the Congo Research Group shows 120 different armed groups operating in the Kivu provinces. Each circle that you see on this map represents a different rebel group. And daily security in the 
Kivu provinces is often shaped by formal and informal alliances that are forged among these multiple armed factions. Uh, these arrangements are often quite short-lived. Many of the respondents that I spoke to would commonly say things like, we're living in a situation where you, you never know what can happen next. In many of the, com in the communities, the Congolese army has failed to provide basic security for these communities and at times is considered one of the main sources of insecurity. So the majority of these armed actors refer to them um, as the Mai Mai, and this is a colloquial term uh, used for self-defense forces that initially emerged during the Congo Wars. Most Mai Mais are relatively small with less than 200 fighters, uh, most of which are recruited along ethnic lines, uh, and they vary substantially in terms of their organizational structure, their capacity, their resources, the level of violence towards civilians. But one of the common uh, features of the Mai Mai is that they, many of them are socially embedded within this specific ethnic communities they claim to protect. And what I mean by this is that the Mai Mai leaders and fighters have family, friends living near or in areas where they operate. Next slide, please. Uh, so between 2014 and 2015, I conducted research in Yabiondo and Sebele, um, located in the Kivu provinces. As you can see from this picture, the two communities I worked in were outside major towns and difficult to reach, uh, especially during the rainy season. My research team and I immersed ourselves into these communities during the data collection phase of this project, we rented a house where we stayed in each community for about four months. Uh, during this period, we interviewed and interacted with a total of 185 uh, participants. Uh, most participants were interviewed on at least two occasions. This depended on the interest and availability of participants. Um, while this was not a representative sample, I used um, purposive and snowballing sampling techniques to ensure diversity in terms of gender, age, socioeconomic status. Um, I made, also made sure to include participants that were uh, considered elite and non-elite in the communities. So elite participants would include customary chiefs, elders, um, restaurant owners, teachers, and non-elites, farmers, fishermen, petty traders, and so forth. Establishing trust with participants varied. Uh, it came easier with some while it was much harder to do with others. And I think that this is really important um, and something to kind of consider further. And I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q&A. Uh, most of my interviews lasted between one to three hours. All interviews were conducted in Swahili uh, and translated into English. And lastly, I conducted thematic analysis of the data, a process that began during the field research and continue well after. Next slide, please. Through immersive field research, I was able to document strategies that emerge at the everyday rather than seek them out. This approach was useful as some of the strategies that I ex examine are practiced um, almost habitually or, or, or intuitively. In fact, some of the individuals that employ these strategies initially did not recognize them as a self-protection strategy. Um, and while I documented several strategies, I'm gonna focus on three strategies uh, derived from my larger data set. So in the first strategy, civilians assess whether armed confrontation is gonna take place in their communities and the different techniques they use to verify whether the information they have collected is accurate. In the second strategy, civilians negotiate with armed groups uh, when levels of abuse and exploitation against community members increase. And this strategy shows the different ways civilians promote accountability among armed actors. And in the last strategy, civilians ex exploit uncertainty uh, to deceive and manipulate armed groups. So for example, civilians create the false illusion that there's, there may be an attack on the army by a rebel group to get the army to change its behavior towards community members. Um, the strategies that I'm about to discuss, these are all very subtle, covert, and non-confrontational. Confrontation, and the reason why these strategies take this particular form is because civilians are mostly concerned about preventing, mitigating, or evading risky situations. 
Um, and in, in doing so, they usually are trying to accommodate or influence rather than overtly challenge the behavior of armed actors. And I think that this leads to um, an inherent tension as some self-protections end up reinforcing uh, or if not reproducing some of the main drivers of conflict. So this is a key, um, a difficult uh, issue to, for us to consider as we move forward. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go through each um, strategy in more detail. So obviously being aware of possible armed confrontation is important for civilians because they want to try to avoid being caught in the crossfire. Um, and we know we've all seen how they would do this by staying inside their homes when fighting breaks out or fleeing to a nearby community as captured in this photograph. Um, participants also explained that they face serious repercussions after armed confrontation. Some of them claimed that they would they felt that they were being punished uh, for any military losses or casualties that were endured during combat. So being aware of when, where an armed confrontation is likely to occur was essential in mitigating these concerns. And respondents developed different tactics to assessing this possibility of confrontation between the army and the Mai Mai. Uh, and, but these strategies were also contingent on the type of relationship that community members had with the armed actor. So when it came to the army, participants um, often had a disadvantage because they did not trust them or have the same type of access with them. And because these relationships were strained, many participants have learned to monitor the daily routine of the army uh, to determine whether they're going on regular patrol or preparing for combat. Participants were also aware of the ways in which soldiers behave when they are about to go to combat. So according to one of the farmers I spoke with, um, she said, you know, before going to, to fight, the soldiers are ready to kill anyone in sight. And while it's unlikely that, well, it's likely that this respondent is exaggerating in terms of the army's predisposition, her observations suggest that soldiers are noticeably more tense and irritable when they're preparing for combat. So in other words, civilians have learned to read the army's body language and disposition. And this, uh, this assessment is set, um, informed on whether they remained at home, went to their farming fields, or sent their kids to school. Now, when it came to the Mai Mai, participants claimed that they would often receive um, an early warning. And this is something that Ollie also mentioned in his presentation. So there was a sign that there, were, that there was going to be um, a confrontation. According to one of the sh sh shopkeepers that I spoke to, the Mai Mai warns us before they fight. They tell us so that we can leave and protect ourselves. Participants explained that they not only collect this information, but had also developed ways to verify whether this information was accurate. Some respondents would ask the Mai Mai's immediate networks whether they, the information they had received was true, um, but when these individuals could not be approached directly, participants would observe their behavior. They would look out and to see whether these individuals were staying home or whether they were packing their belongings and preparing to travel. They would follow their lead. So these strategies show civilians have learned to decipher the behavior of armed groups in different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, respondents had developed several negotiation tactics to mitigate abuse and exploitive behavior of armed groups. And to try to influence armed actors' behavior, participants drew on symbolic or material resources. Uh, when it comes to the Mai Mai, respondents deliberately and strategically evoked uh, savior and victim narratives. So the savior narrative um, is used to remind in my mind that their main purpose is to defend and protect the community. As a farmer explained, the my mind say that they are here to protect civilians and their land. And when we speak against their abuses, we utilize the very same sentence that they use. So participants have learned that steadily pointing out the contradictions in what the my mind claim to do and what they actually do is one way to try to promote accountability. The victim narrative is used when civilians uh, resists or defies one of the armed group's rules and gets caught in the process. So to prevent a severe punishment that usually comes from this, participants will emphasize their victimhood. 
uh, one of the chiefs explained to me, it's much easier to plea with the Mai Mai than it is with the army. When we approach the Mai Mai, we ask them to forgive the individual. For example, I say things like, can you look at the situation we are living in? You know that we are already suffering. How can you add more to this? So symbolic resources such as narratives are useful with some of them I mind because they're interested in maintaining their moral authority and legitimacy among the local population. Civilians are keenly aware of this and have learned to exploit it. Now, when symbolic resources fail, participants will also rely on material incentives. Respondents noted that they have a certain leverage during negotiations with the Mai Mai because the material and intelligence support that some of them give to them. So as mentioned previously, uh, the Mai Mai rely on the local population for basic supplies, such as food, medicine, logistical support, finding a safe place for them to stay or hide, or by collecting or withholding information from the army. Um, if the Mai Mai tries to increase the amount of taxes that are being collected at, at the household level or through tolls, participants will often remind the Mai Mai of how important the support is to them and threaten to withdraw it if there's not a change. So a motorcycle explained, if people did not like the Mai Mai, they could destroy them if they wanted to because civilians could tell the army how and where to finish them. Now, while the claim to destroy the, um, the Mai Mai seems a bit extreme here, uh, a, another participant who spent several months in captivity with the Mai Mai had a similar perspective. In his words, when we would hear the army coming, we had to change locations. It did not matter if it was day or night, the Mai Mai have their people in the communities and this is why it's impossible to ever catch them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the most creative tactics that participants identify was learning to exploit the presence of armed groups and possible attacks. So I'm going to tell you a story of, of how this worked. Uh, there was a period in Sabele where the army's predatory practices increased to a point where it was no longer tolerable. So during this period, the army was targeting the youth, uh, arbitrarily arresting them and detaining them at their base. At best, the youth were accused of supporting the Mai Mai, while at worst, they would be believed to be part of the group. Now, to be released, the accused would have to pay a fine. Community members met with the chief, who in turn met with the army commander, who urged for better discipline. But there was no change in the soldiers' behaviors. Then one morning, participants woke up and found letters scattered through their community. These letters were written by the Mai Mai, warning the army that if it did not stop harassing the youth, the Mai Mai was going to come and attack them. Several respondents considered this to be a concrete example of how the Mai Mai managed to protect their communities, even when they're in the bush. Following this, respondents observed a decline in the number of youth that were being arrested. And while this only lasted for a few months, it was regarded as a su success story by the participants I spoke to. So I became really interested in the story. It was something that kept coming up and shared among many respondents. But as I began to inquire further about it, I learned that the letters that were written um, by the were, were written by a group of youth posing as the Mai Mai to scare the army. So yet, but yet most people that I spoke with still believed that it was the Mai Mai that had written these letters. So there are a couple observations that can kind of be gleaned from this story. First, it shows the ways that individuals have learned to leverage the presence of the Mai Mai and use it to their advantage. And second, it shows the complex balance of power that exists um, among armed actors in the Eastern DRC. And participants told me that the presence of the Mai Mai puts limits on how the army behaves towards them. Now, I've been quite specific about the strategies I found in my research, and I wanna step back and consider some of the broader implications and lessons of these findings. Uh, next slide, and this will be my final slide. So the analysis of the self-protection strategies used by participants in my study demonstrate the different compromises they make uh, to increase stability and predictability in their daily lives. And while self-protection strategies are commonly used, evaluating their outcomes is not always straightforward. 
and this is particularly the case, I would argue, for self-protection that strategies that tend to be subtle, covert, and non-confrontational, which are probably most prevalent in armed conflict situations. Today, I have shown how relations and hierarchies of violence shape self-protection strategies that are used. These key factors need to be taken into consideration uh, when we consider how to support or integrate these strategies into the broader civilian protection regime. Um, Self-protection strategies can sometimes make civilians' lives more secure in the short term, but they also make their lives less secure in the long term. So for example, civilians may request an army group to go on patrol or prevent a rival armed faction from attacking their community or they will solicit the armed actor to adjudicate a dispute uh, between community members. And by making these requests, civilians are also bolstering the authority and legitimacy of these armed actors. So when we adapt a temporal perspective, as I've done in my own research, it shows the difficulties of categorizing these strategies as violent and nonviolent. In intractable conflict settings, Civilians may eventually rely on these armed groups to get things done, as I've seen in the Congo. And this collaboration becomes part of a self-protection repertoire uh, used by civilians. I think I will leave it here for now, and I'll be happy to elaborate um, on my answers during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Carla. No, I think um, you've given us a lot to think about there. And again, just reminding everyone, please put any questions in the chat. Uh, also, just to say, uh, anyone who is not a speaker, please turn off your, your video uh, and mute your, your microphone, just to, to save some of the bandwidth for, for those people uh, who are watching, of which we have many. Um, I just wanted to pick up on one or two things that Carla said. I think, yeah, that certainly some of those short-term elements and the delicate balance between different actors um, that interdependency that you highlighted, uh, but also that many of those negotiations or, or interactions are, are relational. Uh, it's certainly something that we are well trying to look into further with our research, but uh, yeah, maybe we can come into that more in the questions. I just felt like I had to highlight that part. Um, very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you, Carla. So now we go over to um, Nabil Al-Kayati um, from Oxfam, uh, Protection Coordinator in Yemen. Uh, over to you, Nabil. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening for me here in Yemen. So uh, first I will introduce myself. I'm Nabila Khayati. I'm working with Oxfam GP in Yemen as country protection manager. So today we will li like express, like explain our like experience in Yemen regarding community self protection, civilian protection. So the presentation will be about four sections. The first section will start the meaning of self protection. What does it mean? Then we're gonna talk about self protection strategies, then after that, we're going to talk about the community capacity of protection pillars and how humanitarian actors are supporting the capacities of communities in order to emphasize on community of protection. And the last one, we're going to talk about uh, Yemen experience in conducting uh, community initiatives through Oxfam community grants. So if we can start with the first slide, please. So what is self-protection? Uh, self-protection refers to what people do to ensure their own protection from violence, coercion, and deliberate deprivation. So it can occur at individual, community, household, and other subgroup levels. So for example, an individual who negotiate passage at a checkpoint, a family who hides when weapon bearers approach their village, or an entire community that decide to flee in order to avoid conflict. So all these like they are adapting self-protection strategies. So self-protection strategies make up only part of survival strategies. So as, as you can say, self-protection is only part of what people do to survive. Uh, for example, uh, in order to cope with harsh economic conditions, people may resort to survival strategies such as unenrolling children from schools. Families may also resort to skipping meals to cope with a lack of food. Next slide, please. As you can see from the table, so we have like self protection strategies. Uh, self protection strategies can be categorized according to their effect on threats, level of engagement with perpetrators or primary duty bearers, impact on the community. And as you can see, that we have like four self protection strategies along with the engagement level, whether it is like 
engagement with violent and nonviolent or non-engagement level. Uh, so such exercise we're given like to the communities so can help them to ensure, for example, to have variety of strategies people adapt to ensure their own protection. As you can see, the four types of self-protection strategy categories based on their effects to threats. So when you say, for example, prevention strategies, so entail to deterring the actual or potential perpetrators of a threat. So we're preventing it from occurring. So when talk, uh, the second strategy, which is avoidance strategy, are those that allow for individuals and communities not to be exposed to a threat. So the threat itself still occurs, but it is like avoided. And the third uh, strategy, which is mitigation strategy. So entail like reducing the severity of a threat or the range of people who may be affected by it. And the last one is cessation strategy and are those that bring an end to an ongoing threat. So each strategy can be like with non-engagement or non-violent engagement or violent engagement with the perpetrators, uh, duty bearers, or like even other stakeholders. So for example, so you can say, for example, for the avoidance strategy, uh, self-protection strategies, which is non-engagement. So here we have like several examples, but I'm gonna mention only two examples due to the limitation of time. So for the avoidance strategies, we can say, for example, people try to hide from armed actors when it's, for example, a front lines and they are reaching the villages. So people as avoidance strategy with non-engagement, so they try to hide from these armed forces. And another, for example, we have, as you can see, we have positive strategies and we have negative strategies. The negative strategies in red color, as you can see that uh, sometimes people keep girls out of schools in order to protect them from sexual abuse. Uh, why it is negative? Because like uh, violating rights of girls to access like uh, education. And in the same time, they might be exposed to early marriage, forced marriage, and they be, might be denied of, to access like service uh, resources. Uh, so as you can see that uh, this table is part of uh, the CVP resources pack. The CVP resources pack was uh, developed by Oxfam in cooperation with different affiliates in different countries and even with different, uh, different partner, local partners in different countries. So the pack contains 15 template tools, 10 examples tools and 30, 32 case studies and eight recommendation. More than that, it has like a narrative. The narrative has an, an overview of how different resources fit into the program cycle. So I'm gonna like just paste on later on, on the text box, on the chat box. So you can just browse these tools later on. Next, please. As you can see here, we have uh, self protection capacities. As you know that the capacity variable, variable of the risk equation, as we have, we have protection risk equation. So the capacity of communities can be determined according to four pillars. So we have the knowledge pillar, the resources pillar, the solidarity pillar, and the last one we have the engagement pillar. So I'm gonna just mention what are these pillars to, for example, how can we improve the capacity of communities in order to emphasize on community self protection so they can uh, in, uh, decrease the vulnerability and at the same time they can decrease the threat of protection. So uh, the knowledge pillar refers to what communities know. So this encompasses information and awareness as well as skills. So that can contribute to communities, protection from violence, coercion, deliberate deprivation, for example, it can include information on incoming threat, knowledge of successful self-protection strategies, and negotiation skills on the same time. So this is the first pillar. The second pillar, as part of community capacity, uh, uh, capacity pillars, is the resources pillars, which is refers to the materials, resources that communities can count on to ensure their own protection, such as mobile phones or solar powered lights. Uh, the solidarity pillar, so concerns the support community members provide to one another and is closely linked to social cohesion. And the last pillar, which is the engagement pillar, relates to community's ability to engage key actors outside the community, such as duty bearers, perpetrators, service providers, and humanitarian organization. So as humanitarian actors in the field, how can we support to self-protection strategies? So if we come, for example, we always try to build the capacity of communities in order to decrease their threats and vulnerability at the same time. So a self-protection uh, mechanism targeting the whole community. So we try to support them in the four pillars. So the first pillar would try to strengthen their skills, for example, so information collection, identifying threats and how can, and advising a solution and in the same time building the capacity and advocacy. And uh, we all also conduct like several awareness session on the communities for the importance of group work. 
So this can contribute in two pillars, which is the information and knowledge, and the other one, which is unity, unity or solidarity practices. So the other pillar, which is material resources. So as Oxfam in Yemen, usually provide, for example, our community-based protection network, with, we provide them with some uh, cell phones, internet, and we provide them with some incentives to cover their transportation and communication costs. And we provide them with the community grants. So the community grants, we, give, we just give the community with a grant uh, according to their proposal. So I'm gonna elaborate that about the community grants later on the, the next slide. And we're supporting like their existing resources. So whether it is financial resources, human resources, economic resources, or other resources. So as Oxfam, we try to support the community uh, for their available resources in order to improve their capacity in the pillar of material resources. The third resources, which is uh, the third pillar, which is unity or solidarity practices. So as we said, we established community-based protection network uh, in different communities. The community-based protection network usually have fair representation of men and women, where it's 50% representation of men and 50% from women, where they come from different backgrounds and different races. So even we try to include, we ensure that there is inclusion of people uh, with disability and with other minorities and other, for example, marginalized people such as we have Mohammed Shini Yemen. And the last pillar, which is the engagement practices. So we strengthen the community members' capacities and advocacy skills. So they know how can they advocate, what is, how they know how, to, uh, how they, they can map the stakeholders, the influence and agreement. So they can uh, design the proposal very well. And at the same time, we try to facilitate dialogues between the community and duty bearers, where everything is in a community-led approach, where Oxfam just try to support them with resources and technical expertise that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the last slide, which is the community initiatives. So in Yemen, we have like community in initiatives. So Oxfam provide the community members with community grants. And through this community grants, they conduct like several community initiatives. So uh, for example, we, because we need to have like access to the community, which is more effective as we have in Yemen many uh, access constraint. So we try to establish community-based protection networks from IDBs, host communities, from other minorities, people with disabilities, and they come from even different uh, back, uh, social background. So when we establish this community-based protection network, we provide them with intensive capacity building in protection, social cohesion, community self-protection, and community-based protection approach. Uh, and even we provide, for example, the skills, how can they do, for example, the rules, how can they facilitate consultation with their communities, how can they do, for example, inclusion for all community members through their consultation so they can decide, for example, what are the protection threats and they prioritize the risk and, uh, and decide on the type of intervention that they need to protect themselves. So uh, after that, uh, the community-based protection network, they held like different consultation with their community members. Oxfam try to support them with facilitation and we just support them to make them uh, include, for example, all community members from all the backgrounds and races that we have in the, in the community. So once they do the consultation, through the consultation, they try to define the protection risks that they face and the uh, analysis the, these risks or threats, then based on the risks and threats, so they try to do, for example, uh, stakeholder analysis, so they know who are with them, who are against them, so they can, for example, propose a, a, a suitable intervention for their for protection threats. Then after that, they come up with a proposal. Uh, they submit the proposal to Oxfam along with their budget and at the same time with the work plan. So as Oxfam, we review, for example, their proposal and along with the budget and work plan. So the proposal uh, were, should evaluate it based on the extent to which they would like to respond to protection threats by implementing preventive mitigation and responsive measures. They should contribute to the social cohesion of the target communities, ensure effective participation and consultation with community members, when women, men, youth, and other vulnerable people, together with the CBBS members. And it should be implemented according to clear work plan objectives and budget, which should be shared with Oxfam in order to be endorsed. And the last time, it should ensure like sustainability. So after they conduct their community initiatives, so uh, Oxfam just do like some, uh, some evaluation just to know the impact of this initiative, whether it is sustainable or not, in order to have some lesson learned for the coming like community state protection activities in other, for example, target areas. Uh, for example, of the initiatives. So we have, for example, uh, the risk uh, reduction at night initiative. 
So community members with CBBN's fac facilitation maps the protection risk they were facing in one of the governorates in Yemen, which is Aden. So they prioritize the risk of being assaulted as they walk through a cemetery at night. So at this cemetery is a shortcut for more than 1,000 families, comparing to other alternative roads that take almost more than an hour to move the way around. So the cemetery had no lights for most of the hours for most of the hours at night. So community members proposed a lighting initiative. So the initiative had no light for most of the hours at night. So community members proposed a lighting uh, proposed that uh, to have a lighting initiative. So people who were facing uh, a lot of risk while they work through the, the cemetery at night hours, as there were, for example, some women and children who have been attacked or abused. As well, the cemetery used to be a place for youth to take drugs at the same time. So, uh, uh, so the, the the community members proposed for Oxfam to support them with some solar powered lights. So we supported them and they uh, installed these solar uh, powered lights. And, uh, Oxfam technically supported them, uh, supported the community to install the lights and build the capacity and the maintenance of these solar lights. On the same time, there was another, for example, initiative to run campaigns against drugs use and its risk in the same area in coordination with religious and community leaders and in the same time with the duty barriers to support them with some security and safety measures. So we have uh, many other like initiatives. If you are interested to read more about initiatives, you can just visit our resource like uh, CBP resource pack, oh, yeah. as you can say in, as you can, I just, I'm gonna just uh, gonna paste them in the chat box. Thank you, and thank you for the panel, and over to you. Thank you so much, Nabil. And uh, thank you for outlining there in particular how this, uh, these concepts and the potential angles of research really intersect with a programming environment. I think there's uh, a lot for us to delve into further there, and I can see that a lot of people are asking for the access to those slides. Um, so yes, we'll, we'll work on that for everyone. Um, and particularly, actually, you talked a lot about community inclusion, which I think is a, an important topic for us to, to be addressing throughout uh, maybe the discussions later as well. Um, I just need to correct one thing. Apparently, it was a, it's a typo in, the, in the, uh, the housekeeping earlier that it's, in fact, reminding the audience to turn on your cameras uh, if you feel comfortable. So apologies for that. Uh, and yes, please, if you're comfortable to have your camera on, we would very much love to see your faces. Um, so yes, please do, please do turn on your cameras. Uh, but please do also still keep your, your microphone muted for now. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll pass over to um, in fact two speakers from NRC Colombia, uh, Mayra Alejandra Avendano Rincon and uh, Diana Villamizar. I hope I pronounced everyone's name right. Uh, so without further ado, uh, over to you, Mayra. Thank you. Hola, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Muy buenos días, buenas tardes o buenas noches. Eh, bueno, en principio nosotros eh, queremos darle las gracias por la invitación a este espacio. Estoy en compañía de Dayana Villamizar. Eh, ella es una de las protagonistas de nuestra experiencia del programa de líderes, de líderes sociales, eh, enfocados en temas de autoprotección. Y antes de pasar a mi espacio, pues quisiera darle la palabra a ella, eh, que, que mejor persona pues para contar un poco lo que ha significado el impacto de ser líder en Colombia y cómo este programa pues también ha tenido un impacto muy beneficioso en la vida de ellos y de sus compañeros. Entonces le cedo la palabra a, a Dayana y a continuación estaría yo. Muy buenos días, eh, agradecida por el espacio. Mi nombre es Dayana Villamizar, eh, soy venezolana, eh, emigré de Venezuela en el 2016. Por madre tengo la nacionalidad colombiana. Tengo un lema que para ser líder no es que nacemos siendo líder, sino que la vida o los tropiezos nos enseñan a ser líder. Eh, tengo 25 años de edad, ya tengo eh, tres años en liderazgo. No ha sido nada fácil, ya que el territorio colombiano es un poco complicado en temas de seguridad. Yo soy amenazada. Eh, mi liderazgo ha sido un poco complicado porque aparte de ser amenazada, no me he rendido, sigo luchando. Eh, a mí me incentivó el ser líder, la necesidad de muchas personas, al igual que las mismas necesidades que vivía yo. Lo viven mucho, mucho más familias y de pronto hasta peores en condiciones que yo. 
he tenido la oportunidad de poder dialogar con varios grupos al margen de la ley porque nosotros los líderes en Colombia estamos expuestos a que en cualquier momento nos manden a llamar eh, para decirnos las cosas o, o hacernos preguntas o cómo estamos trabajando. Eh, he tenido la oportunidad de pararme frente a ellos y decirle de pronto las cosas que están haciendo mal. ¿sí? Eh, tengo varios compañeros que también han sido amenazados unos por grupos al margen de la ley. Yo en mi, en mi persona, yo fui amenazada fue por un agente público, por un funcionario público. Eh, no fui amenazada por un grupo al margen de la ley. Este, pues el liderazgo es un poco complicado. Nosotros... Eh, ¿Me puede pasar la página, por favor? Nosotros los líderes vivimos expuestos, eh, tenemos un temor, sí, tenemos temor porque eh, la verdad no confiamos en el Estado, digámoslo así, a la hora que necesitamos una protección como tal, la protección que nos brinda el Estado no nos sirve, o sea, sería como un cuchillo de doble filo para nosotros los líderes. Yo creo que el liderazgo más fuerte es el de, el de una mujer. Es más difícil que el de un hombre. Somos como discriminados, de pronto el sexo débil. No nos ven con esa capacidad de levantarnos, de hablar, de luchar, de enfrentar, de ser resiliente. Y resulta que de pronto somos hasta mejor. No es por decir nada, no, pero creo que a veces somos hasta más organizadas a la hora de tomar una decisión. Eh, pues la, los, la protección que nos brinda el Estado como tal a nosotros en algunos sitios no nos favorece eh, tenemos mucho que agradecer al Consejo Noruego que es quien nos ha enseñado a educarnos a poder implementar nosotros mismos este, nuestras, nuestras protecciones las autoprotecciones yo, eh, para nosotros es que no hay mejor profesión que la misma comunidad. La misma comunidad proteja a su líder. La misma comunidad advierte a su líder si en algún caso se ve en riesgo. Nosotros vivimos en una zona en, en Colombia un poco complicada, y es la zona del Catatumbo, donde diferentes grupos al margen de la ley residen en la zona. Y aparte, no solamente los grupos al margen de la ley, sino también eh, el mismo gobierno. Eh, hemos sido, pues, digamos, la siguiente, por favor. Eh, eh, más de, sí, eh, hay más de 116 líderes en Colombia asesinados. Este, pues ese acuerdo firmado de paz de los asesinatos de los asesinados de 332 son indígenas, 75 afrodescendientes, 102 son campesinos y 77 son miembros de juntas de acción comunitaria. Ahí estén los líderes de junta de acción comunitaria, presidente de, de JAT o líderes sociales, la verdad no, no tenemos una protección del Estado. Eh, la verdad, nosotros cuando somos amenazados no tenemos un proceso como tal, no nos hacen seguimiento, no nos preguntan de pronto cómo estamos o cómo vamos o qué necesitamos, si en algún momento sentimos que tenemos miedo en nuestras vidas. Eh, la verdad, hay un abandono total y estamos expuestos. Estamos expuestos por ambas partes porque nos sentimos en una balanza. No tenemos protección de los que deberían de estar ahí con nosotros, que es el Estado. Y tenemos que saber actuar en frente a un grupo al margen de la ley que de pronto no, no, esa acción no nos vaya a perjudicar a nosotros. Es complicado liderar así. Eh, tenemos que saber lo que vamos a decir, lo que vamos a hacer o cómo vayamos a actuar para que nuestras vidas no corran riesgo. Eh, eh, nosotros los mecanismos comunitarios de autoprotección surgen como respuesta a los riesgos que enfrentan las comunidades y su desconfianza en los mecanismos de protección que nos brinda el Estado. 
basado en la interre, interrelación entre el individuo, la comunidad y su territorio. Busca la seguridad física, económica, política, ambiental, así como el bienestar psicosocial y la cultura. Están alineados con derechos humanos y, de, y el DIN, Derecho Internacional Humanitario. Pues este, allí, la verdad, nosotros, como les digo, eh, nos hemos educado y creo que gracias a eso es que podemos decir que tenemos conocimiento y no queda más sino que agradecerle al Consejo Noruego y a todas las entidades que nos han apoyado. Dayana, muchas gracias. Justamente estas experiencias de vida que nos menciona Dayana fue lo que motivó este programa de protección de líderes sociales en Colombia, eh, que hoy en día pues ya hemos completado tres capítulos. Ha sido un ejercicio muy interesante. ¿Me ayudan por favor con, a pasar la, la siguiente diapositiva? Ha sido un ejercicio muy interesante que ha tenido eh, por objetivo poder fortalecer las capacidades de líderes y lideresas sociales, especialmente líderes eh, presidentes y miembros de las juntas de acción comunal, que en Colombia tienen un rol muy importante en la medida en que en muchas de las zonas rurales apartadas de Colombia, en donde el mismo Estado tiene una poca o a veces nula presencia, digamos que las juntas de acción comunal tienen un rol preponderante en la que es lo más cercano a algún nivel organizativo en términos de lo político y digamos que es como el nexo eh, más fuerte que pueden tener las comunidades con algún nivel del Estado. En ese orden de ideas para nosotros fue muy importante empezar a trabajar con los presidentes, secretarios, eh, otros miembros de las organizaciones de base, de las organizaciones comunitarias, a empezar a fortalecer sus capacidades desde identificar cuáles eran los riesgos que estaban viviendo en, en los distintos territorios, encontrando que a pesar de las distancias geográficas había muchas similitudes en cuanto a que la mayoría eh, estaban muy expuestos, recibían amenazas. Además de esto, algo muy particular es que en Colombia los líderes sociales son personas que emergen de manera muy natural y trabajan casi que de forma muy orgánica. Muchas veces no tienen la preparación académica ni los elementos técnicos que les permitan ejercer su liderazgo de una mejor forma. Es así como este programa de autoprotección empieza a enfocarse en identificar cuáles eran las necesidades que ellos tenían en materia, por ejemplo, de formación, qué temas era importante que pudieran conocer, que les permitiera alcanzar un mayor nivel de incidencia. Y en ese orden de ideas, eh, esta autoformación estaba enfocada en reducir los riesgos. Identificamos que en la medida en que nosotros fortalecíamos sus capacidades, también había una reducción de riesgo porque ya tenían un conocimiento sobre cuáles eran las rutas, sobre cuáles eran los mecanismos legales, eh, que aunque están establecidos desde hace mucho tiempo, Ejemplo, la ley de víctimas, que es el marco natural para la población víctima del conflicto armado en Colombia, y que a pesar de esto había una distancia y una brecha muy grande entre eh, la población, es decir, hay un desconocimiento de cuáles son sus derechos y por ende no hay una manera de acceder a esos mecanismos. Además de eso, empezamos a trabajar toda la implementación y el desarrollo de planes de autoprotección comunitaria eh, con fundamento en las mismas experiencias de vida del territorio, qué funciona y qué no funciona. Eh, creo que Dayana hablaba de esa radiografía del escenario colombiano en la medida en que hay una gran desconfianza hacia la institucionalidad y a pesar de que existen leyes, la gente no se siente representada y, eh, y por eso muchas veces los mecanismos comunitarios terminan funcionando más que las rutas establecidas en el Estado. Además de eso, eh, entender que habían algunos temas en, dentro de las mismas comunidades, como por ejemplo, aprender a resolver situaciones que de alguna manera amenazaban el mismo liderazgo, ya no, ya no de amenazas externas, sino de las mismas amenazas dentro de la misma organización en términos de llegar a consensos 
era muy importante, entonces se empezó a trabajar con ellos temas relacionados con comunicación, eh, con resolución colaborativa eh, de conflictos, pero dentro de las mismas organizaciones. Algo muy importante que también identificamos y que se incluyó dentro del programa es que eh, no solo se deben fortalecer las capacidades, sino también analizar cómo el ejercicio de liderazgo también impacta de manera individual la vida de las personas que lo ejercen y eh, el proyecto también contempla eh, el apoyo directo a los líderes que han recibido amenazas en términos de asistencia técnica y apoyo para reubicación dentro del mismo país. Eh, también nos dio la posibilidad de desarrollar un material de información interesante que, que podríamos compartirles. Eh, se hizo una cartilla sobre temas de liderazgo, desde entender qué significa ser un líder en Colombia, toda la normatividad aplicable para, para los líderes y lideresas en el marco de la ley de víctimas eh, y temas muy importantes desde una óptica muy pedagógica, muy didáctica. Y finalmente, involucramos a las instituciones para generar una mayor cercanía entre la institucionalidad y los líderes a fin de cerrar un poco esa brecha entre el uno y el otro. Y bueno, finalmente, para no extendernos más, hay una serie de lecciones aprendidas que nos ha permitido tener este proyecto y, y que ha sido un aprendizaje muy grande para nosotros porque eh, como Consejo Noruego hemos aprendido mucho de los, de los líderes y lideresas con quienes hemos tenido la fortuna de trabajar y es eh, que ha funcionado y va a seguir funcionando eh, la consolidación de redes de apoyo entre ellos que subsiste mucho tiempo después del proyecto que gracias a este tipo de proyectos se ha logrado agilizar medidas de protección establecidas por el Estado que anteriormente no funcionaban para muchos de los líderes que han estado amenazados, que también nos ha permitido eh, la construcción de los planes de protección, generar apoyos a largo plazo y que finalmente todo lo que transferimos queda en manos de los líderes y lideresas quienes lo siguen replicando dentro de sus comunidades. Eh, el fortalecimiento de las capacidades de las instituciones es algo que para nosotros ha funcionado mucho y que ha acercado mucho a líderes y lideresas con las instituciones y que definitivamente eh, ese conocimiento que se ha incrementado con ocasión de la Escuela de Líderes ha sido una fortaleza. Eh, era como la experiencia que queríamos compartir y bueno, las dos estaremos dispuestas a, a responder las preguntas eh, o comentarios que tengan más adelante. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Mayra and Diana. Uh, so now we will go to our, our last speaker before we come back to some more reflections. I'm very conscious of the time. Um, we will hand over now to Hannah Jordan with NRC uh, to kind of summarize and, and move us on to the Q&A. Thank you, Hannah. Over to you. Thanks, Bob, and thank you everyone for um, the presentation. It's been, really been amazing. So I'll just go very, very quickly because I actually want to give a lot of time for comments. But two main points on my side is we really wanted to um, support the linkages and the coordination. So really looking at um, cross siloed programming and looking at what are the linkages between peace building, between access and being protection. And that looks at not only the project that SAVE and NRC are, are um, the research that we're doing, but also crossing those silos and what are the lessons that we can learn from different sectors? What are the things that we can take? What are the things that Um, how can we do that in a principled way? And how can we really learn um, and support each other in that? Next slide. And then the, so the last slide that I'm just going to talk about really, really quickly is that there are four areas that we've identified as challenges and opportunities. Um, the first opportunity that I think is central to say, and it's great following Myra and Diana, is really the fact that community um, led and self, um, civilian self protection cannot be done. Um, without being community led. So you have to, um, in terms of working and facilitating with those communities and with those individuals, they have to really be led, those action plans have to be led and those civilian self-protection priorities have to be led by the communities themselves. Um, the second thing in terms of a challenge is the, man is the management cycle. Am I talking too fast? <laughs> Um, so how do you really make a program in terms of the way that the humanitarian architecture is set up that is actually community led? So how do you make indicators that are broad enough um, that allow us not to determine how those community action plans or how those strategies are going to look from the beginning, 
Um, but how, but to let the communities decide that. So how do we actually structure our programs? How do we structure our budgets? Um, and how do we actually go through that program cycle and the humanitarian program cycle to in support to support and make sure that those actions, those strategies, those plans are actually community led. So that's a challenge, but also an opportunity. Um, the, the fourth thing is really looking at monitoring, learning and evaluation. So really, how do you do m and &E for prevention? How do you look at m and &E and try and monitor something that if you are successful, you, it didn't happen. So also um, looking into the m and &E around prevention and getting really, really creative with that m and &E, pulling and building resources from multiple different disciplines to really look at the tools that we can use and the different indicators that we can use um, on that on that m and and also really supporting the fact that the as Myra also said is that really learning as we go and learning continuously almost on a daily basis from communities as well and the fact that those processes are community led um, can also help us to design those m and systems and then the last thing I wanted to say and maybe Bob I can hand this over to you after that is that also how does curtain certain um, current counterterrorism legislation um, either challenge this type of work or prevent prevent um, humanitarians from engaging in that because a premise of negotiation is that um, you have to be able to negotiate and so what are the um, challenges with the counterterrorism legislation but I guess I will hand it over back to Bob I did want to keep that quite quick and give about 10 minutes for questions Thank you, Hannah, and yes, <clears throat> thank you for summing it up, summing it quite quickly there. Uh, I would just say as well, before we go to the Q&A, that we're very lucky to have actually a representative of CEDA with us here today, uh, the, the donor for this project that we've been talking about. So uh, after the Q&A, we will be briefly coming uh, to Anna from CEDA as well to, uh, to present their, their thoughts on this approach as well. Uh, but for the questions, we've actually had quite a few questions. So in the time available, I actually wanted to just merge a few of them together uh, and ask the panel um, this kind of group question which really about how to maintain neutrality in contexts where armed groups are considered beneficial uh, or exert social control uh, and are therefore perceived as positive by the community and kind of linked to that question bring in another one how communities and international actors interact differently with that challenge of neutrality um, so ho hopefully that question is clear and I wanted to throw that first actually maybe to Carla because I think it, it relates directly to what you were discussing around some of those mechanisms that communities have for communicating or having signals from armed actors and maybe some of the strains that has on the perception of neutrality so maybe if you want to come in first around around that and then we'll, we'll pass it around a little bit we've got about maybe seven or eight minutes uh, to discuss over to you Carla great thank you um this is a, obviously a very difficult question, something we think about and st all struggle with. But for in the context that I worked with, for me, what was um, most difficult in trying to assess neutrality is just even like these familial relations with our actors, right? And how how are we expected for? It's difficult to expect for community members to be neutral when they're so intimately related to them. And this is not always the case. It happens in certain case in certain situations. But then what the research shows is how in certain situations that can activate, um, it can it could be a leverage, right? It can be a way to influence and get get information and push back. Um, but in terms of how to further maintain those neutrality for at the community level, I I I find that I find that really difficult, um, especially because daily coexistence is is shared with them in many cases right so yeah, thank you Carla. yeah and uh, i'm really sorry about the limited time actually to all the panelists as well and um, we will have to have another session at the next year's uh, forum um but maybe if uh, if the uh, interpretation would work uh, myra and um, diana if maybe if you want to come in and talk a bit about how yeah, if you could talk maybe a little bit about how um, how neutrality comes into your work as well, or the struggles with neutrality. Bueno, es es un dilema al que nos vemos expuestos todo el tiempo. 
creo que tener claro eh, nuestra posición dentro de los territorios es muy importante, mantener siempre los principios humanitarios y de protección es lo que de alguna manera nos permite tomar decisiones acertadas y siempre poner de presente el bienestar de las comunidades y la protección de, de, de las comunidades y de los equipos. Eh, pero todo el tiempo estamos tomando decisiones, sobre todo cuando nos enfrentamos a casos. Hemos tenido casos muy complejos en donde hemos tenido que debatir ampliamente dentro del grupo eh, cuál sería la decisión más acertada en términos de si apoyar una acción o no nos puede cerrar, por ejemplo, el acceso humanitario. Creo que es algo a lo que siempre estamos expuestos, pero que finalmente tener presente los principios humanitarios nos ha ayudado eh, a sortearlo de la mejor manera posible. No, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, again, sorry for the limited time to, to answer that. Uh, maybe we'll go to, um, to Nabil next to talk about how uh, an organization looks at this in programming. And then uh, Oliver, maybe we come to you on, on that same question. So maybe Nabil, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Just could you elaborate more on the question, please? So yeah, we're, we're looking at, um, yeah, so how neutrality comes into that, uh, how communities are negotiating with armed actors or setting up certain uh, precedents or arrangements to ensure their access or protection. Uh, and then also looking at how maybe communities have different tools or different ways of approaching than international organizations. Uh, and obviously, uh, from your perspective, maybe you can talk to us about some of the tensions that Oxfam faces in, in the neutrality aspect of this kind of programming. So as you know that in Yemen, we have many like actors, whether it's like state and non-state, but usually, for example, to keep neutral while our implementation. So uh, whenever like we establish a community-based protection network, we ensure that we have like different like actors from different, for example, participants from different background, different parties, different political, for example, parts and so on. So even we have sometimes like a backup of other actors to support like community-based protection network. So usually the community-based protection network, they are the one who's leading everything. So as Oxfam, we just try to support them with the resources and to support them with the facilitation. So as we keep in the neutrality, so uh, our community-based protection network, usually, for example, whenever we have like problems with uh, the IDBs, so the, the members from the IDB sit from the member, with the members from the host community. So they sit together to discuss uh, and negotiate about the problems. Then, for example, they get like support from the host community members through the community-based protection network members from the host community. So through, for example, the leading, the whole process is being led by the community themselves. What we do as Oxfam, we try, for example, to build the capacity and the humanitarian principles and what's the meaning of being neutral and as, for example, being community-based protection network members, they have like a specific TORs that they have to sign and they have code of conduct that they should, for example, represent, represent all the community members and do not be, for example, on, for example, side of any, for example, uh, fighter actors. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Nabil. Yeah, and uh, I have a lot of follow-up questions, but they'll have to wait for another time. Uh, maybe, Oliver, over to you, just to yeah, kind of sum up how that fits into your research as well. Yeah, I'll be really brief. Thank you all. Um, so neutrality of civilians is really a key issue behind all of this self-protection thinking. Um, how do civilians stay out of conflict? Well, part of it is not taking sides. And a big issue that civilians face is stigma in the context of armed conflict. So civilians get stigmatized as being part of one armed group or another, and then they get targeted because they're perceived as being enemy group supporters. And so a huge task of these civilian organizations is how to manage that uh, civilian community neutrality. And part of it is what I what are you maintaining autonomy through different strategies or mechanisms, including vouching for individuals who have been accused, trying to manage those threats, um, conducting this sort of in-group in uh, observation of, of individuals to understand who maybe has uh, links uh, with arm with armed groups um, and so there's some different mechanisms that different communities have used to try to manage that neutrality and avoid links with armed groups um, and then just to the second question briefly uh, you know I think uh, how do or how do communities engage with supporting organizations I think the key 
prerequisite, as I mentioned, is community organization. So, you know, you have to have some focal point or some figurehead of the community to maintain uh, those relations. Um, and yet this, this creates a, a dilemma, a catch-22 uh, for both communities and their would-be supporters, because if you don't have organization to start with, how do you come in as an outsider and build that organization? So it's, it's not easy to get off the ground. Um, and I think some supporting organizations might be reluctant to engage with communities that don't have their own organization, but they're maybe precisely the ones that need help the most. Thank you. No, thank you, Oliver. And I think it's a, it's a good dilemma to kind of end our discussion on there as well. Um, so yeah, apologies to everyone who asked other questions. We will uh, either maybe come back through email or we find other ways, uh, of course, next year. Uh, but I wanted to hand over now to uh, Anna Sakhlin Ramazotti uh, from uh, CEDA, maybe to make a comment about, uh, about CEDA's approach as, as a partner in this project as well. Uh, so over to you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it's fascinating to have the opportunity to have such a rich description of the many ways in which civilians engage uh, in self-protection strategies and, and how actors are supporting such strategies. Um, and when it comes to our approach, uh, maybe first uh, uh, more broadly, uh, based on the observation uh, that we are still in a situation where much more efforts and uh, resources are invested in responding to, to the needs that arise from violence and abuse being perpetrated. Uh, CEDA took the decision uh, that reducing the protection risks uh, that crisis affected, affected people face uh, was going to be the overarching objective for protection in our human, humanitarian strategy that was launched early this year. Uh, and the key challenge for reaching this objective is, of course, to understand what it actually takes to reduce protection risks. Uh, and, and I think one of the most important conclusions that we, we have drawn is that to reduce protection risks and to ensure uh, a sustainable impact in, in, in that regard, uh, more consideration has to be given to people's own capacities uh, to address and reduce the risks that they face. Uh, and in the humanitarian system, we have become much better at assessing vulnerability, uh, and also to, to address vulnerability. And we see that our partners are very careful to ensure inclusion of those um, particularly vulnerable in their programs. And this is, of course, having a great impact uh, on those who only a few years ago could, could have missed out on life-saving assistance and protection. But we also see that much more attention needs to be given to what people already do to protect themselves and, and how they can be supported through uh, strengthening of existing capacities and systems and mechanisms already put in place, as, as has been discussed to, today. So I think a first criti critical element uh, in developing programs that focus on strengthening people's own capacity to protect themselves is, in our view, uh, the undertaking of a context-specific uh, protection analysis that looks uh, not only at the threats that people face uh, and who in the community is most vulnerable to those threats, but also at the capacities and systems and mechanisms that people have uh, and have put in place to protect themselves. Um, and since a bit over three years now, I, I think it is, we, we are providing support to interaction and their results-based protection program, uh, which is a program that focuses on providing support to humanitarian actors in the field in applying uh, a results-based approach to protection. And, and here, the protection analysis uh, that takes into account the threats, the vulnerabilities, but also the capacities uh, is an extremely important component. Uh, and last year, uh, with, with support from, from CEDA, Interaction organized uh, their first annual results-based protection practitioners roundtable, where more than 40 practitioners from 21 international NGOs got together to discuss what it takes to reduce risk 
and a, a very interesting and important takeaway from, from that roundtable discussion was that we must understand that affected people actually are the primary agents of their own protection. Uh, and they will therefore have to be at the center of efforts uh, to support them. And amongst the range of tactics that communities use to reduce risk uh, that were identified, was of course uh, community members engagement with armed actors uh, and interestingly uh, participants acknowledge that even though there is a strong emphasis on the importance of community leadership and partnership they felt that too often this felt more like mere lip service and not a true investment in community capacities to act as agents in risk reduction uh, so, so in terms of, of what is preventing us from, from engaging in more community-led protection strategies, uh, uh, just before, before I finish, I think some of the more important ones that are often mentioned uh, are the lack of practical methodologies that allow uh, actors to support community-led uh, responses to humanitarian crisis. So here we see, of course, an important role for us as a donor uh, to play. Uh, in supporting our strategic partners to develop and, and strengthen strengthening working me methodologies that su support uh, such strategies. Uh, and another important aspect uh, often mentioned is, of course, the time pressure that accompany humanitarian programs with short-term grants. And uh, here, uh, CEDA is looking into providing multi-year support to our strategic partners. We are already doing this. Uh, but I would like to emphasize that here, the main purpose is really to, to facilitate support, uh, life-saving humanitarian assistance and protection services. Uh, so yes, uh, I'll stop there, but that, that, those are, I think, in, in reflections from, from our perspective and, and what we see as key uh, components for, for being successful in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, no, I think it, it ties in very well with how we've been approaching this for each of the speakers today, um, the importance of community agency and bringing that into the heart of our work. Uh, I know that we are, we are now out of time, uh, so I only have time now to thank everyone for taking part today. Uh, thank you for all your contributions from the panelists. Uh, thank you for the questions that we've received. I, I just wanted to, well, obviously next year, hopefully we'll be back to present to you the findings of the project. Uh, but for today, I just wanted to leave you with a, a quote actually from uh, Diana was speaking before and said that um, one's own community is the best protection ever. Uh, and I think that really comes down to the, the core of this project and what we're trying to achieve is to really bring that into the core of our work. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, yes, I wish you, wish you a great rest of the day and we hope to see you next year at the Global Protection Forum. Thank you. Thank you all.